participants for the online webinar on geo intelligence and career prospects it is a privilege to have leading industry experts dr rupesh panjani from ibm pune mr rakesh sinha from amazon hyderabad and professor dr tp singh director of sig among us to deliver the lecture on the same i introduce you to the first speaker professor dr tp singh director of sig he has obtained his phd from indian institute of remote sensing having a teaching and research experience of, of over 20 years in the field of geospatial technology he has successfully executed various research projects funded by indian space research organization department of science and technology ministry of environment and forest and japan and international cooperation agency he has published more than 50 research publications in various reputed journals i request professor dr tp singh to deliver his talk the participants can type their questions in the chat box which will be discussed at the end of the session over to you sir uh, uh thank you uh, dr sandeepan uh and thank you for your uh, nice introduction uh a very good evening all of you uh, from uh, symbios institute of uh, geoinformatics i'll uh, uh i'll i'll congratulate uh, dr sandeepan das because uh, he has chosen a very apt topic uh, that is a geospatial technology and career development uh, how a pupil or how a student uh, will look forward while they have a geospatial uh, in their domain and how they are going to have a whole career path what would be their steps uh, that would be going to be justified by Uh, many of uh, uh, our industry partners or industry experts those are present in this uh, webinar uh, friends uh, i'll uh, recall back in uh, 1998 when i started my uh, career in uh, geospatial technology with the laboratory of indian space research organizations at uh, that time a uh, very few industry that time working on a geospatial technology and you can take those uh, industry on your fingertips uh, some of very uh, prominent right now they are existing uh, and uh, working well that time uh, in in a year 1995 indian space research organization also launched uh his very ambitious satellite uh, that was irs 1c after a 20 years of uh, or in fact a 23 year of uh, a landsat which was launched in the 1972 so uh, irs 1c was having a capability uh, of a multi spectral with a very high resolution uh that time 23.5 meter was treated as a high resolution uh and it was having a multi spectral of four band and the five band uh, uh four band uh, uh spectral resolution was there so that that was the time when we when i started and people were not knowing and they were not very Uh, acquaintance to these kind of a technology satellite image was uh, like uh, some kind of a rocket technology means how satellite image look like ninety uh, percent people were not uh, imagine that uh, that time that uh, looking a uh, uh, satellite image in year two thousand three when uh, Google entered the in this uh, technology and then that uh, this technology has in the enhance a uh, very very um, uh, say uh, a phenomenal change has been uh, seen in this technology uh now in this year 2020 2021 when i am looking uh, that how much growth has occurred in this technology how much prospects has come up in this technology that is enormous prospects i can uh, visualize the time when 1998 i look back i was having a two or three options to get into it 
only the one space organization was there. If you want to do a research, now you have a multiple organizations where you can uh, do your research if you are looking towards a research. That time only two industries were there. Now in 2021, you have almost 200 different in industry in India where that you can work in a geospatial technology. So you can see that it is almost 100 to 200 times change in a, a whole dimension, whole uh, paradigm has totally shifted from uh, two industry to 200 industry and plus, and many more are there. Many are the startups which we are not accounting over here. Here I am going to tell you a very briefly about my organization, uh, where from where that I am. Uh, in my the first slide where that you can see. Uh, this is a uh, Symbiosis International University where we have almost 18,000 plus students. Uh, PSD, 520 students are there. Uh, we have also PSD in the geoinformatics uh, field also. Uh, we offer almost more than 84 programs and we have uh, eight uh, faculty. Uh, very recently, we started a faculty of medicine uh, we are that uh, uh, MBBS uh, program, uh, we are running uh, very successfully. Uh, we have a faculty of architecture, we have a faculty of engineering, um, uh, we have faculty of law, mass and media communication, and so on and so forth. Uh, totally, if you'll see that uh, we have 48 uh, constituents, as well as that the department also, and they have uh, several different programs. Now coming to that education, what we are providing education, if you will uh, go back in 1948-49 when uh, Radha Krishnan Commission, who was that uh, president of uh, India, he has, uh, that time he was uh, working with that the uh, commission for education commission, and it was a very first commission for education purpose. That time he has mentioned a very specifically and categorically that what is a required for education? And one word he has a mention word there that the technology which work uh, at the ground level means the skill based technology is required uh, if you want to change in an education system. And that was uh, since 1948 to 49 when he has mentioned this thing. Now in 2021, we are again advocating those uh, that is skill based technology and very recently that NEP that is a national education uh, policy which was launched by uh, um, uh, government of India that also advocate a uh, skill based learning a skill based as well as that uh, competency based uh, learning and without a skill based without competency based it would be very difficult to have a career prospects or the career growth. And geospatial play a very important role while we are talking about a skill-based learning. Uh, it, it, has a, uh, it is a combination of a, not only the uh, GIS, but it has a combination of that the many other technology uh, and combined with we are making it a, a geospatial technology. Uh, if you will look on this, that word is a progressing. Word is progressing uh, or that process is going on. If you will look on that scenario, we have uh, almost uh, 37 uh, countries which, we, which OECD uh, count as a developed country. And uh, World Economic Forum, they are saying it's uh, around 81 countries are having a very high economic uh, level. When 81 countries or 87, 37 country, only that no 18% of these countries, basically we are calling them as a developed country. And after this development, uh, you are witnessing that number of uh, disasters, you are uh, witnessing uh, food uh, scarcity, you are witnessing uh, 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 the climate change which is happening and that is only that 
right now we developed and we loaded only 18%, right? Imagine when we are going to be load 100%, what is going to be happen when we are witnessing uh, every day a different kind of a climate change is happening in this month, in the month of February and the March, very early March, when I'm feeling that it is a little bit hot, it means that the something is happening, right? Uh, what would be that in the future, where we are going to be land up? This is that the scenario which we can see that you are going to see these uh, uh, trees or you are going to see the climate which we are right now feeling. You In the future, you are go only going to be imagine on your video, you are going to be imagine on your YouTube channel, you are going to be imagine on a different, uh, uh, you are going to be imagine on a different uh, uh, um, uh, OTT platform. So this is that the change which is happening uh, in, in the last, uh, uh, say, uh, last 20 years and up to 25 years. Uh, now, if you will look at the flood landslide and the flash flood or earthquake, it's a very frequent. And we have witnessed in the last two years, if you will look on that last two years, we witnessed that locust swarm, uh, which was uh, purely because of the climate change. Uh, we witnessed uh, that a farm cyclone, we witnessed about that flash flood. And very recently in Uttarakhand, in uh, Rishi Ganga River, we have witnessed uh, um, uh, flash flood. So that is, uh, uh, this, this is that, no, uh, we can say the impact of a progress, which I told you in a previous slide, what, what happened in the previous. Uh, now, what, what we are that now, what is the consequences? Consequences of a progress which is happening. So the hunger is the one of that important consequence which we are going to look in the coming future. Uh, it is very difficult to provide a food to all across a uh, population which are existing or uh, at our uh, mother earth. And if you will see that what is the impact of this disaster, if you will look on the disaster, uh, almost uh, 675 billion US dollar uh, lost uh, because of this disaster. And among of that, maximum almost a 60% covered by a drought only. And drought is happening purely because of uh, what we are witnessing, it's a climate change over there. Uh, so if you will look on that, you no, know, if you will see this figure where that you no, know, uh, the people can say it's a eco, uh, food chain and that uh, top, top uh, uh, pyramid, uh, uh, where that human beings or that male uh, uh, person, male human is going to be on the top. And we are suppressing all other animal. When we are suppressing all other animal, that we are basically disturbing our food chain. However, uh, we need to have a very cordial relationship with that each and uh, every uh, uh, objects or living being which are on uh, Mother Earth. So the first one, if you will see, that is a purely it is a ecosystem, and ecosystem is going to be when we have a cordial re relationship. How this cordial relationship will come in? Okay, where that? How we are going to be coming with this cordial relationship? When uh, we are utilizing our technology for the benefit of uh, not only that human being, but also that benefit of a living plants also, living uh, uh, the objects which are on our uh, mother earth, that how much object we need to extract, how much object we, re we put remain over there for the sustainability or for the sustainable development. So that's why UN development goal has come up, uh, which we need to uh, achieve in, uh, uh, in year uh, 2030 or 2030. If you will look all these 17 uh, development goals, the UN development goals, on this that the 
five goals are directly connected with a geospatial technology, which you can solve with the geospatial technology. You can see that how much importance a geo, uh, geospatial technology over here. If you will see by the name that no poverty, zero hunger, uh, climate action, life below water, land, life on land, as well as that you no know, sustainable uh, urban life or the sustainable cities. These are no, uh, the directly it, it, it has connected with that the geospatial uh, technology. And if we want to achieve this uh, here almost, uh, each and every one require uh, 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 use of uh, uh, this technology. Elevens are indirectly related to a geospatial technology, right? So you can see that the scope of a geospatial technology is enormous when we are talking about only the UN sustainable goals. Uh, if you will look that you no know, geospatial technology, how it is connecting with this, you will look on that transportation solution. If you will, you can look on the telecommunication solution, you can look on a utility and the facility mapping. You uh, go on that the aerial mapping, web cloud services, urban development, uh, smart cities. Uh, you just name it. You can find uh, enormous number of application for a geospatial uh, technology development. Uh, I'll tell you that very uh, recently that work which we have uh, uh, done in that uh, Symbiosis Institute of Geoinformatics to provide uh, uh, to provide uh, uh, support to the farmers those are working uh, in in the basically in the semi-arid and the arid region and you know that uh, uh, Maharashtra in fact that western and uh, central and uh, eastern Maharashtra is a very much uh, drought prone area. So we developed a model where that you can get information, a real time information about uh, drought, uh, what is happening uh, over there. And it's a very uh, uh, interactive uh, uh, model where just you can uh, click on and you will get information of a uh, uh, um, you can get information about that what is happening like that the February, if I want to go, I can uh, see uh, over here, uh, just to view on that, that what was the position of a drought at a particular day in a February 2021, right? I can see that another one that in uh, day 10 February, what was the position? You can see that how it was there, not only the 2021, I want to compare about that the 2022, 2020, and in February, same February, I want to look on that. And this is a uh, second February I want to see and I want to understand, yeah, last year it was a better condition. Now that the condition is not as better, what was that the previous year, right? And it is a real time information we are getting where the geospatial is uh, playing a very important role. So uh, coming to that, uh, another uh, use of a geospatial technology to that flood hazard mapping, uh, using a different layers, finding out that which, air, uh, which area is that uh, vulnerable for a flood. Uh, then comes to that, no, finding out the prediction, that the predictability of a uh, uh, a, a flood donation where that the flood is going to be occur. So you can see this is that you no know, very low to very high. How much uh, chances of to getting a flood? This is the area of a Mahanadi uh, in a Odisha state, and you can see the Bhuneshwar and the Katak. The Katak region is that the quite and very uh, 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 very highly vulnerable uh, to towards that the flood. Uh, some of that, no, if we are talking about the zero hunger, how we can achieve a zero hunger, one of that very uh, ambitious program of uh, government of India, which uh, where that SIG was uh, very much uh, um, uh, means important partner for that, uh, 
this is the accelerated irrigation benefit program. In this accelerated irrigation benefit program, we understand that irrigation potential, how much irrigation potential has been generated, which, which going to be converted to that uh, agriculture potential. Once we are able to understand about agriculture potential, that will provide me information that how much area we have, uh, arable area, how much cultivable area we have, and what would be that you no know, prospects of agriculture is going to become in that the next year. Uh, now coming to that uh, uh, geospatial, that if we are talking about a geospatial curriculum, uh, which is going to be help uh, uh, to achieve our uh, United uh, Nation goal, that curriculum should have or encompass uh, around that, no, the 26% IT, which may have a AI or a deep learning or uh, uh, which may have a machine learning, uh, at least that the 20% should be there, a component should be there in our, in the curriculum. Uh, then comes to that the 20-20%, which is the major uh, uh, part of uh, uh, geospatial system. That is the one is uh, GIS and another is the remote sensing. And then comes to the photogrammetry, which has a phenomenal change has been come after this uh, drone uh, mapping actually. And uh, recently uh, uh, geospatial guideline, which is issued by the government of India, it is going to be enhanced this photogrammetry as well as the mapping is a very uh, tremendously it is going to be and you are going to be witness this thing uh, in the coming uh, one or the two years. Uh, coming to this technology, basically geospatial combined with the GNSS, GIS, Earth observation and the 3D scanner, it's facilitate and the facilitator of this thing that uh, OGC compliance, it should be there. Uh, whatever the application we are going to be develop. Uh, some standards uh, supposed to be there. Uh, it should be interconnected with that, uh, with that each and every uh, um, uh, technology so that can be talk with each other so that no, uh, uh, we may have a compatibility with that the technology and coming to the process where the business digital engineering and the workflow is going to be exist. Then uh, we have a delivery platform. Uh, delivery platform, uh, the social media application, web portal, and the finally it comes to uh, geospatial technology. Now we have uh, drivers of this technology, which is very recently has come up. Uh, that's a IoT, artificial intelligence, cloud, uh, wireless and the broadband. And these uh, wireless broadband and these technology, big data, cloud computing, automations, uh, which helping to that the GNSS, GIS, Earth observation and 3D uh, scanning to extract a more information and the reliable information. So that it is going to be uh, fulfilled that uh, uh, business processes like a uh, uh, building information management, uh, distribution management, customer relationship management, and environmental impact man, uh, analysis, and so on and so forth. Uh, many of those application sectors are available. Some of that I have written over here, but enormous of uh, application sectors are over there. And it has a value impact around, you can look on there that uh, uh, around that uh, near to uh, 1,000 uh, billion dollar impact or, uh, over there. And maximum impact is coming that you no know, from the transportations and uh, utility sector. Uh, I'm, if you look on the geospatial market, the geospatial market uh, only uh, where the analytics or the GIS is playing, it's uh, around that $88 billion uh, in, in the 2020. But when we combine the GNSS, which is that no, uh, uh, in the last couple of uh, years come up in that no, very regressively, when that no, automobile and the transportation company, they are utilizing um, GNSS for the location-based services. 
and it has a lot of con uh, contribution in the geospatial market because the maximum of industries are nowadays utilizing uh, GNSS or uh, location-based services. You can just uh, name it. If you are, if you shut down this GNSS and the GPS uh, system, you can just imagine that how many companies are going to be uh, closed. Uh, so it has uh, almost 260 uh, uh, billions of a dollar uh, contribution and the total, if I'll say, it has uh, uh, 439 um, uh, billion dollar of uh, market. So the growth, if you look uh, from 2013 to 2017, it's uh, around 11.15. Uh, then growth is after uh, uh, 2017, then that we have uh, till 2020, uh, around that the 13.6. So you can see it has around that uh, uh, growth, 2% uh, 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 difference between that last uh, five year we have seen it. Uh, if we look on that the geospatial scenario in the academics, so uh, uh, more than almost that 100 universities, they are offering a geoinformatics program. Uh, but very few universities have a geospatial or geoinformatics as an institute or as a constituent. Uh, out of uh, 18 to 20 percent covered by a private university because um, uh, that uh, it's require a lot of infrastructure if you want to start a, some a geospatial uh, institute. Uh, most of uh, uh, private institutions they are running a postgraduate program that could be a master of science program, master of technology program. And that, uh, um, they also have a, some a postgraduate diploma, master of master in the postgraduate diploma. Uh, and the trend is now changing. Actually, if you'll see from that 1970 when uh, Landsat was launched, that time uh, uh, Earth observation and the remote sensing was in the top. And it till it was high till that 1995, 1997. Then in 2001, 2003, when we can say that early 2000, uh, it has uh, GIS crossed this uh, remote sensing domain. Uh, and it, it is basically the time when the Google was entering in the geospatial technology. And then uh, in 2016, 17, uh, now that the GNSS has uh, is as a playing a very important role, uh, when the transportation industry, when that Ola, Uber, and the many other transportation industry, as well as that many other location-based industry, they started utilization of uh, GNSS as a, a, a utility uh, for their businesses. Uh, I'm giving you a very uh, uh, correct or very authentic data set because the data set which I am uh, providing you information that's from my institutions only. So job profile market that the last five years, if you will see, it varies in the different sector, but the maximum uh, uh, recruitment was occurred in uh, GIS analyst part. Uh, only in the 2013, 2014, uh, 15, it was a little bit uh, less, but however, that in other years that I have seen, it was a quite good um, development was there in that the GIS uh, uh, analyst. We can also see that the sum of uh, digital cartographer uh, kind of a job has also emerged because of a requirement of a different industry uh, about that. And uh, GIS executive, which has come up and then that uh, we have not seen that GIS executive job in, in the uh, last uh, one or two years. Uh, but yes, uh, we, it may come in that the coming year also. Uh, coming to that, no, stipend and uh, salary wise that uh, I can say you that in the 2012 to 2017, uh, GIS developers, they got a very good stipend in their fourth semester. 
So uh, in, in, in that uh, uh, master program, generally uh, we have a fourth semester stipend varies actually uh, from uh, 5,000 to 25,000. Uh, it, it is a uh, fourth semester while that the students are, are on uh, institution role only, but they can get uh, this stipend and final placement varies uh, from three lakhs to 5.5 lakhs. Uh, but after the three year experience, this is that 100% growth uh, uh, I have uh, uh, visualized. Uh, it, it goes around from that uh, six lakh to ar around 11 lakh uh, in between that the range after three to four year of experience. Uh, having a geospatial technology in, the in your career, your uh, uh, salary would be a, certainly is going to be more than that the people who does not have a geospatial technology in their uh, career. Uh, so it's it's a information which I have uh, taken from that the some third party source. Uh, students placed in the different sectors from that application development to that uh, higher studies because that are many students they want to pursue their higher studies in the different universities in India as well as abroad. Uh, we have seen that the maximum recruitment was in uh, application development sector and that goes down to that the business development and then subsequently for that analysis and uh, data generation. A uh, number of the companies, those basically working in this area uh, from uh, in the geospatial technology. Uh, uh, these, these companies are, in fact, why I'm saying in this area, because they visited some time in, in that uh, uh, Symbios Institute of Geoinformatics for their placement. A part of this that the some of other com companies are also working in this area. Uh, uh, like uh, from Accenture, IBM, PwC, Cognizant, and the Google, uh, uh, and the TCS. Uh, many of uh, our alumni also working in these uh, companies. So coming to that, no opportunity for this, uh, for the education sector uh, uh, means uh, there's a one hand, no, uh, this is an excellent growth in opportunity. But that another, end, I'm saying that uh, market uh, or that no manpower, acute shortage of a manpower is existing. If you will see that the 16, 17, all around that 0.2 to 0.3% trade manpower were available only for that the public sector. So it's a require a needed trained and a skill based people or a skill based human resources those who will be ready to work in the industry and those who are able to match their capability with the industry requirement. And that is the need of a current days. So on this note that I am uh, ending my uh, presentations and uh, uh, you can see this is that the picture of my uh, one of my uh, graduate batch uh, they are not happy because they have uh, received their degree. They are happy because before getting a degree, uh, they have a job in, in their hand actually. So that is a happiness actually. And uh, if you have any question, you can put in your, uh, in, in the chat box. Thank, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Dr. T.P. Singh, for such a inspiring talks. The participants can post their questions in the chat box. Okay. So we'll move to the our next speaker, Mr. Rakesh Sina. He is an alumni of Symbiosis Institute of Geoinformatics and currently working with Amazon. He has vast experience in the GIS domain and has worked in leading companies like Cybertech and Hair Maps. I request Mr. Rakesh Sinha to deliver his talk. Thank you so much, Sandeepan. I mean, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, 
thank TP sir and SIG for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this topic. And uh, rightly mentioned by Sandeepan, uh, today I'm here not representing Amazon, uh, but I'm here as an alumni of Symbiosis and as a GIS professional. Uh, before I proceed, uh, I'd just like to <laughs> mention that the last slide, the thank you slide, uh, sir, you had on your deck, that reminded me of my days at SIG, my convocation. So that was really nice to uh, look at. I mean, that was something really nice. Um, okay, uh, moving ahead. Geo-intelligence. So fortunately, uh, I got an opportunity to work on geo-intelligence for a couple of years between 2015 and 2017, wherein I was working with an organization uh, which dealt with uh, the defense sector of India and uh, disaster management departments and forestry departments and so on and so forth, uh, police as well. So that is where I was first introduced with uh, geo-intelligence. Uh, now, uh, geo-intelligence, the word itself uh, uh, suggests geo plus intelligence, which is geospatial plus intelligence, which refers to the geography or uh, space attribute, which, which we in GIS call as physical, locational, and human uh, touch that we have. And then the intelligence, uh, which means the kind of data or the assets that we can create out of it. Uh, this is where it all started. And uh, today I'm not sharing any PowerPoint presentation. I'm not showing that. I will be solely talking on the basis of the experience I uh, was able to gather um, while working with that organization. So while I was going through uh, different documents that we had and how people used to work in geo-intelligence sector. Um, the first thing that I learned was what is the definition of geo-intelligence? Because I knew what is geo-informatics. But now this is something new, geo-intelligence. I knew that it has something to do with geo-informatics uh, geo again. I mean, it's geospatial. But probably it's a dedicated sector or a dedicated discipline um, that comes or that falls under geospatial technology. So that is where one of uh, my managers then, he told me that if you need, or, or if you want to read about geo-intelligence, uh, just go through the definition that National Geospatial Intelligence Agency has formulated for it. And that is where I was first, uh, uh, I came across it, wherein it says that the exploitation and analysis of imagery and geospatial information to describe, assess, or visually depict physical features and geographically referenced activities on the surface of the earth. Um, and there, were, there are three basic components of geointelligence, which is imagery, imagery intelligence, and geospatial information. So uh, when I got to know this, I was kind of confused between what is imagery and what is imagery intelligence. I mean, both of those looks kind of similar to me. So later on, I got to know that imagery is what we mentioned, the satellite imagery is wherein we use it for visual interpretation of things or to try and understand what is there on the surface of the earth. Whereas the imagery intelligence talks about uh, the kind of data that can be extracted out of that imagery, uh, which again becomes an asset uh, while performing any sort of intelligence. So, <clears throat> And then obviously the geospatial information, the attributes and uh, the shape files and all sorts of things that we create. Uh, so it's an amalgamation of these three things uh, that makes of geointelligence. Not forgetting again, uh, the human piece of it and the process that we use, uh, which again makes it to the five components of GIS that we have. So uh, ultimately it's something which is pretty similar. Uh, and that is how I understood it entirely. And I worked on it. Now, when we talk about geo-intelligence, uh, the word intelligence straight away points to the fact that it has something to do with uh, military operations or tactical planning or uh, the police sector that we have. So one thinks that this is something which is pretty new, uh, but let me tell you this, uh, geo-intelligence is not something which is new. 
it has been there for a very long time the only difference that we had earlier and that we have now is now we have it in 3d which gives us an uh, edge on what kind of data that, that we are handling and uh, um, this is now being used by uh, commanders and humanitarian uh, responders and all sorts of disaster management uh, um, agencies uh, who work in this because they want to uh, stay a step ahead uh, to handle uh, any calamity and then with uh, three dimensional picture coming in uh, it gives uh, an exact idea of what is the kind of issue that we are experiencing what do we see what is the kind of terrain we have to work in either it's a military operation or it's a disaster management uh, scenario that we see now how all of a sudden this all increased so off late i mean uh, we all have been seeing that a lot of terrorist activities uh, started happening um and then it uh, came up with a demand for detailed knowledge of the area that is in question so that is where uh, the need for a very powerful visualization tool came into picture and that is where this discipline uh, geo intelligence um, was considered something uh, very important i would say extremely important and if it could provide information in almost near real time then i mean you are all you always have an upper hand on this thus this entire piece became uh, the core to military operations and tactical planning strategic operations uh, trying to get to know the area uh, the terrain uh, the culture the societies that we have in there uh, the kind of population that we see and then um what is the kind of uh, uh assets that can be utilized in those areas so all these things then emerged and again uh, it made up a very solid foundation for geo intelligence now today uh, i am talking i am talking about my experience which i came across when uh, i was working uh, for a company in 2015 back in 2015 today i see that geo intelligence has changed the way we respond to events uh, and uh, as a first responder to any calamity if it happens uh, just to give you an example uh, tsunami it can destroy uh, everything i mean it's like uh, it's totally uncontrollable but then uh, with the help of uh, sensors that we place in the sea uh, with the information the kind of information that what is the kind of population that we see in a particular area in the coastal area do we have any schools buildings uh, medical facilities do we have something on the higher ground something which can be saved from uh, tsunami uh, what would be the route that uh, a disaster responder uh, can take the first responder can take and reach out to the uh, impacted people these things if we know it pre uh, beforehand and at the same time then you have real time imagery feeds coming in from satellite imagery is from drones then you know the terrain you actually know how to take care of the situation and these things are something which becomes very important and that is why geo intelligence has grown leaps and bounds today now what is the kind of answer uh, geo intelligence provides so uh, i would say the first answer it provides is where am i where am i standing right now what is the location the coordinate that we uh, generally mention uh, then where are my assets where can i get help from uh, what kind of help i can uh, receive uh, what is there in store for me i mean if i am stuck so i saw one of the slides on sir's uh, powerpoint presentation where he spoke about flood again flood is something wherein villages and villages are destroyed 
just to give you an example, Sita Mani in Bihar, uh, it's a place where almost every year uh, flood happens. And then government, um, generally uh, they, they call in uh, the defense people to take care of that area. Now, what if these people have access to real-time satellite imageries to, un to see and to understand uh, where exactly there are people who can be saved or who are still alive? They can actually get to that location. How could they get to that location? What is the time it would take uh, to get to that location and to save those people? Then this is one. Another is, uh, let's talk about military operations. There, the answer that I can get is, where are my friends? Where are my enemies? Where, where, where is the hostile party uh, who is supposed to attack on me? And I can prepare accordingly. What does the area look like, the surrounding look like? Uh, how do I navigate uh, along a certain terrain? Because uh, the terrain keeps on changing. Um, at one time, our army is positioned as Timothan border. At uh, another place, it may be uh, positioned in somewhere in, uh, for example, Kargil or uh, some Rajasthan border or a, a desert area. <clears throat> so the terrain keeps on changing. And this information would help us know how can we navigate. Uh, then the next answer that uh, it provides, geointelligence provides is what could be the impact. A projection can be uh, built out of it. That what is the impact that we are looking at? Then how to prepare? This is the biggest uh, um, decision-making tool that I would consider when uh, I talk about geointelligence. Because ultimately, uh, it's pretty important to understand how can we help people? How can we ensure that people are not getting impacted? Or in case they are impacted, how do I prepare them to avoid the worst? Now, having all these answers is always good. So what is the need of the hour? Today, the need of the hour is rapid response. I mean, everything has to be super quick. If there is an issue, I need a resolution at the earliest, then I also need digital data availability. I mean, if I have paper map, converting that paper map or looking at that paper map and then getting to know the uh, terrain or getting to know the information, that would not help. I mean, just to give a simple example, I have uh, 2000 uh, rows in the attribute table. Now, if I have to search something, I would directly go find and look for that particular thing. And once I click on it, it can actually, I mean, we have the option to zoom to location. Uh, but then if I have a paper map, I have to go through the entire stuff and then point out where exactly I'm looking at. So this is something which again, gave a boost to the geospatial industry as well. And again, uh, like I mentioned, geointelligence is um, somewhat similar to what we do as uh, a GIS professional. I mean, it's almost same. Then uh, another uh, requirement is updated data availability. We need that. The sooner I have the updated data, the better I would be in a better position to respond or to take a decision or to perform an analysis. Um, intelligence of unknown territories. If my uh, troop has to move to an unknown territory for an operation, uh, wouldn't it help that <clears throat> what, is, what is the kind of territory I'm looking at? Uh, what are the obstacles that I could come across? And I have a very good example for this actually. So I, I believe all of us my, might have seen uh, Uri Surgical Strike, the movie. But there, uh, a drone was being used. I believe its name was Garud, uh, uh, which flew into the hostile territory, took pictures, snaps, videos. And then um, in the command center, uh, the defense command center, people, people were actually looking at it. And then basis the information that they gathered uh, 
the surgical strike was planned. Now, um, it may look like that this could be something which uh, we can come across in movies, but trust me, uh, this is how actually uh, geo-intelligence data is being collected. We use all sorts of uh, uh, information gathering tools to collect data to have an upper hand over our enemies. Um, then frequent updates for ever-changing terrain. So snow-covered peaks, we also need to understand if there's an avalanche or anything happening. That is another update that we need to keep on getting day in and day out because every hour the situation keeps on changing on such terrains. And then final thing that we require is high resolution satellite imagery. So I heard Sir mentioning that when he started uh, this satellite imagery, the resolution of satellite imagery available was 23.5 meters. I mean, if we think about it today, uh, I don't think that would be of much help. And that is why we have uh, so many satellites in the orbit today, which provides uh, uh, one meter resolution, sorry, <clears throat> one meter resolution, 0.5 meter resolution. I mean, that is the need of the hour. Then uh, defense organizations also have uh, access to different satellites, which we normal people don't have. And uh, they can actually capture data uh, in real time and uh, better, obviously, I mean, uh, it's pretty understood why do we don't have that kind of uh, access. We don't need it, but people who need it, they actually make very good use of it and they uh, defend our country uh, accordingly. So these are a few examples uh, that I saw. Now, um, there are other examples as well, uh, which I came across while working for multiple clients. So I worked with the, in the, uh, with the police departments of different states in India. I worked with army, navy and defense forces. Uh, when I say I worked, I mean, uh, on behalf of uh, that organization, um, I was looking into the projects or uh, reaching out to them. Uh, obviously, I, I mean, for obvious reasons, I can't quote uh, the actual incidents that happened or uh, how uh, they work on it. But I can I can for sure tell you that in military or tactical planning, uh, geo-intelligence plays a very important role. Um, for example, if uh, our troops have to uh, make an attack on a particular place or uh, they need, they get to know an information and intel that uh, at certain place, uh, few terrorists are there. Now we need to neutralize those uh, terrorists. What needs to be done? That is where the tactical and strategic planning comes into picture. And first question comes is, where is the enemy, the location? Then how do we go about it? Is there a blind spot in that area? Uh, can they see us and can attack on us even before we get a chance to uh, hit them? What kind of weapons can be used to ambush our convoy or our troops? What is, if such a thing happens, what is the kind of casualty that we are looking at? How can we be prepared? Then basis the weapons that uh, our troops have, uh, what would be an ideal position to uh, make an assault? Um, a line of sight analysis. So we have this in uh, almost all the GIS tools that we have, uh, ArcGIS or QGIS, line of sight analysis, wherein uh, we can actually see uh, uh, to what extent I can see and to what extent uh, the enemies can see us. Then uh, the projectiles uh, can be decided that, okay, my weapon fires at, let's say, 100 kilometers per hour. Uh, at what angle I should be keeping them and I can fire, I should fire them that it should uh, hit the enemy. So this is the kind of uh, information that uh, one can uh, derive out of uh, geointelligence. I mean, this is the kind of exercises one can do. And this is just an example. They do much more than this. I mean, uh, it's entirely on a different level. Uh, today, um, 
I mean, um, I mean, we see this in all Hollywood and Bollywood movies as well. Uh, whenever there's a, a, a military operation being planned, you would see that there's a control room set up and uh, satellite imageries can be seen on the screen. Then real-time data feeds are coming in. This is how actually a command center works. And almost all the defense agencies or uh, uh, police departments or uh, anyone who needs and utilizes GIS and geospace, geo intelligence, they have these control centers set up for them. And that is where people like you, me, and uh, people from geospatial industry, we can actually help them big time. And we are being utilized in uh, such scenarios. Uh, drone usage happens uh, a lot. Then uh, uh, geo intelligence is also is also used for logistic supports for military operations or disaster responses or any civic emergency that happens. And uh, the utilization is not limited. I mean, it can go on and on. Advanced sensor technologies and multiple types of geospatial data is being utilized to visualize events and. Uh, um, but these sensors can be utilized to map the terrorist hideouts or uh, uh, the data mining can be done from uh, geotag uh, tweets that come in, satellite imagery of the terrain or uh, drone surveillance can be done, GPS tracking is being done. And these are pretty common things that we see day in, day out in movies, that, but probably uh, it doesn't register that actually this is how it works. At times, it, we feel, I mean, to be honest, when I was not in this domain, yes, when I used to see this, uh, it used to be like, this can happen only in movies. I mean, uh, in reality, this would not happen. But now I'm kind of surprised that no, I was wrong then, and it happens that way. Um, now, um, every uh, intelligence agency or defense uh, organizations people representing them, they also come up with multiple uh, articles uh, wherein they speak about how they actually utilize uh, these kind of information and geo-intelligence. So uh, I was actually going through the Indian Army website. So there's a section on Indian Army website named as knowledge online section. So I generally go through it. I find it pretty interesting going through different uh, articles that uh, people write. I mean, um, those are views of the people. It's not the views of the army, but still they are good read and uh, it's mentioned there. So while going through it, I actually came across uh, one of the articles written by, uh, I believe the name was Puneet Bhalla. Yeah, I came across that article wherein he spoke about geographic information system enabling knowledge-based operations. And when I started going through it, I found out that it was actually uh, referring to geo-intelligence and it was entirely on geo-intelligence and how it works and how it functions, what is the kind of uh, information they gather, how they make use of it, um, how it helps them, uh, capture those information and uh, get actionable outputs out of it. Uh, and that is what we do as a GIS professional. I mean, we gather all sorts of information, the spatial, non-spatial data, and then we try and get a, um, an actionable output uh, for decision-making purposes. That is what we do. And that's pretty uh, amazing that uh, they also have something similar on their websites. And uh, I've, I'm not Surprise, because uh, they work in that sector and they need to have that also, uh, that kind of information and uh, information usage. Now, um, this was all about geo-intelligence and what is geo-intelligence and uh, uh, something that I saw from uh, my lens, I would say, um, during my tenure of two years with uh, working with, the, uh, with these uh, settlements. The next question would be who hires a geointelligence professional? And uh, the answer is pretty straightforward because we spoke a lot of, I, I spoke a lot of, about it right now. Uh, 
just to name a few national security and defense uh, organizations uh, they have their vacancies they hire people who uh, are from this background and who can actually um, contribute to it then uh, military navy defense agencies intelligence agencies uh, homeland security Uh, the law enforcement people they would need uh, people who who are actually familiar with your intelligence and who can actually uh, uh, contribute to what they are doing uh, then we have emergency response systems uh, i mean the first responders uh, for any disaster i mean uh, to give you an example again uh, another example just that just clicked uh, i came across this example while working uh there was a forest forest fire and uh, we the first responders were finding it very difficult uh, to reach to that location and save those animals who were stuck um so that is where uh, this happened some time back so that is where to avoid any such scenarios or to avoid any such situations uh they plan they installed cameras uh on at different locations in the forest and they actually utilize data uh, all they took the vintage data and they uh, created a uh, a cluster that what exactly which exactly was the area which uh, saw maximum number of fires or uh, uh, they also uh, pointed out the areas where uh, sandalwood were being stolen a lot of times uh, fences were being broken people were poaching uh, for uh, forest uh, i mean uh, wood for the, for fire and stuff so using gis technology they actually created a map hot spot of those those areas and they placed cameras at those locations to avoid any such thing happening and it was like a real time feed which was coming in and any uh, occurrence that Uh, that was taking place they were actually making note of it right away and uh, action was being taken so this way they were actually uh, they use utilize uh, vintage data and then they were collecting new data and they were updating the database at the same time ensuring that everything is being covered then security consulting firms they again uh, are somebody who actually looks into geo intelligence and or uh, who hire professionals geo intelligence professionals <coughs> uh geo intelligence career i mean specifically geo intelligence career uh, this is majorly uh, related to military operations uh, disaster and threat response and disaster relief now disaster encompasses a lot of things uh, around it i mean natural calamity or um, man made i mean uh, terrorist attacks and stuff uh, military operations uh, police operations which is uh, which happens uh, on and off so these are few things which actually uh, uh, is very imp- uh, these are the people who actually utilize these professionals and uh, like uh, i also heard uh, sir saying that uh, we require such professionals and uh, application developer was the one which uh, which was major majority of the times people require application developers and then uh, it was data creators and then analysts but trust me uh, today in the market i mean in the gis industry I, i'm mentioning in the gis industry we need good people we need people who know their stuff who actually uh can come up with something actionable and who can perform some good deep dives analysis and at the same time uh create applications nothing like it uh that is something which would help the community and help everybody um i'll stop here i would not like to go on along because i know rupesh sir is also waiting uh, any questions for me participants can post their questions in the chat box
I think some of the questions already been uh, posted on a chat box. Yeah. So, uh, 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 there is I, one question, sir. Uh, elaborate the use of GIS and remote sensing in the field of wildlife conservation, like animal migration pattern, bird migration pattern study, or biodiversity research. Okay. Uh, so yes, I mean, wildlife conservation, again, uh, one of the examples that I just gave wherein uh, we, I spoke about how uh, they are using camera sensors and feeds to capture any um, undesired activity which is happening in those, uh, on those locations on in those forests uh, and uh, ensuring that that is not happening because by creating hotspots um, the mitigation uh, i mean the activities can be prepared in such a way that these things can be avoided animal migration patterns or bird migration pattern study i mean honestly uh, I have not been able to work in that domain, so probably I, I would uh, need some help from TP sir here. Uh, he would be in a better position to answer this question. So, yeah. So uh, yes. So I can. Um, so on a behalf of uh, uh, Rakesh, I am going to answer you about that utilization of a geospatial technology in uh, wildlife conservation as well as that. You no. Know, uh, pattern. So the live wild, uh, wildlife conservation mainly to understand about that corridor analysis, how that uh, uh, fragmentation is occurring in the forest patches, uh, which and the finding out the habitat suitability. These are that the major importance of uh, geospatial technology in uh, wildlife conservation. So if you know that which is that habitat, suitable habitat for a particular animal, then you are able to conserve an animal on the particular location. Let's say that if you are talking about a cheetah, you can't uh, place a cheetah in a, somewhere in a Uttar Pradesh because you, it is very difficult to find out that area where the cheetah can travel actually. So cheetah have a, almost a travel around uh, say that uh, uh, 50 to 60 kilometer in a day then that you require that much area where that the cheetah can reside. Same thing for ele elephant corridor also. Coming up to biodiversity conservation. So uh, plant biodiversity conservation, uh, there are a lot of uh, evidence are there where the geospatial technology can be utilized for uh, biodiversity conservation. Basically prioritize the area, uh, finding out that area which are uh, very, very uh, vulnerable or area which are very, very biologically rich area that can be identified using a landscape level technology, landscape level ecology, and using a geospatial technology. Uh, because the many indices are there which you can uh, you which you you which you can utilize to derive that no uh, uh, some some information about a particular landscape. And the landscape directly connected with the biodiversity conservation. So there are the fragmentation, porosity, patchiness, uh, juxtaposition. These are the indices which you can utilize to make a model uh, to provide you a biodiversity or the disturbance index as well as to biodiversity uh, prioritize area. Uh, you can connect uh, a Shannon Wiener index or Simpson index, which you can extract from a field and the ground data, connect with that uh, model, and you will get a, a biodiversity uh, prioritized area. So this is the uh, um, uh, use of a geospatial technology in uh, biodiversity conservation and the wildlife uh, uh, conservation. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Rakesh, for sharing your valuable experience. Now we'll move to the next expert speaker, Dr. Rupesh Panjani. Let me give a brief introduction of Dr. Rupesh Panjani. 
Dr. Rupesh Vanjani has done doctorate in information management, MBA in information science, and BE in electronics and communications. Currently, he is working in IBM as director, driving global transformation and capacity centers. He has worked with several organizations like ESRI India, Accenture, Torrent Power, and currently he is engaged as a strategic and CXO level for enabling organizations achieving digital transformation through innovations in enterprise applications, business and cognitive solutions, blockchain, transformation to cloud, RPA develops, and geospatial technology transformation. I request Dr. Rupesh Panjani to deliver his talk to the audience. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Yes, yes. So good evening, everyone. And thank you, uh, Dr. T.P. Singh, Dr. Das, and the entire team of Symbiosis for having me here. I mean, you know, it's a great pleasure and opportunity to interact with you all. And uh, as, as, as I have been keep saying, like, you know, interacting with the new talent is always, is, is, is always the pleasure. I mean, you know, it's, it's always an opportunity and it has been a kind of a, in, in, in my 21, 22 years of uh, experience, it's always been a kind of a, like, you know, a pleasure to interact with the upcoming, uh, or we say, the skills or the upcoming brains and the upcoming experts in, in the industry. And uh, first of all, let me congratulate you all for, like, you know, coming and coming towards during the time in the world where the world needs the talent the most. I mean, you know, there is an immense demand about the new skills, the immense demand about not just GIS, but the applications of GIS in, in, the, in the entire industry. And when we are talking about GIS, what I have seen in my 21, 22 years of career, uh, like, you know, GIS does not remain as just a standalone technology or a standalone, what do you say, a tool. There are immense number of applications which GIS contributes to, and and the the example being like you know we have started like you know booking our Ubers and Olas like and then the center of that particular entire interaction is our map. We have started ordering our food, like the center of our application is the data, the GIS data, the, the maps. We have started locating the nearest health centers. The center is data, right? So everywhere GIS has been touching lives, and like you know, I'm talking of an era in which uh, Dr. D.P. Singh just touched upon that there, like you know, I have, we have seen the times, like you know, in in our uh, early 2000 and late 90s, where people used to see a satellite image, and it was used to be an opportunity, like right? you know, that how the satellite image looks like, right? So Dr. D.P. Singh and and we go a long way, almost 20 years, uh, 21 years before when. We were together in Dehradun and we used to see that, okay, if a satellite imagery comes with 5.8 meter resolution, what will we can do? Like, you know, so, so there is a tremendous, I mean, I mean, not elaborating, I can talk on GIS, I can talk on applications of GIS for hours and hours, like, you know, it's, it's a passion, like, and it's always a pleasure to, like, you know, uh, interact with the upcoming talents like you all, and uh, like, you know, the people like you know the the innovations that symbiosis is bringing into the students it's always a pleasure so i mean you know uh, i would like to be very uh, crisp and concise let's try to make it more interactive like you know i don't want to come with a lot of gyan lectures around i i would like to make it more interactive where we can interact with each other take this opportunity of 30 minutes to share our ideas i would just like to touch upon a very small uh, like, you know, some seven, eight slides on the deck on what the application and the potential that we are sitting on right now. Like, you know, we are sitting on a disruption. Actually, we are, we are, we are coming towards a era, like, you know, we are entering into era where everything is going to be a geo-intelligence. Everything would be surrounding. I'm not like, you know, kind of a, a, doing a complete hyper analysis or I'm just not elaborating too much in a sense but trust me uh, team i mean trust me uh, my friends everything is going to be gis centric everything is going to be 
location centric you talk about in iot you talk about augmented reality we talk about ai ml deep learning blockchain 3d printing everything is going to be surrounded and the center of this is going to be a data right the digital data that we are talking about and the step which indian government has just announced last last week about liberalizing the the mapping policy like you know so we are currently sitting on almost like around the uh, a 30000 crore type market but we are entering into era where we see a tremendous potential so let me just like you know quickly uh, jump i mean you know, enough of talks but uh, i would i would like you no know, happy to get interrupted in between whatever i am talking about so please feel free to interrupt and my again request would be uh, like you know all my interactions like you know let's be interactive like you know stop me right at the moment and uh, like you know let's discuss like you know share ideas and uh, like you know enhance our understandings before i jump to uh, like you know couple of slides which i have thought i will share with you a uh, quick introduction uh, like you know as this uh, dr das already said i have started my career in in isro in, in 1998 when i passed out uh, like you know as a kind of a gis not even analyst but we used to learn gis software install lotion of gis software on unix computers in those days used to be a big achievement so from from those days to applications of gis like you know understanding a product of gis like you know how gis can be applied into various industries so those entire shift of thoughts we, i have seen particularly from from 1998 till 2021 so today what i'm going to talk about is how our future is going to be look like like you know how geo intelligence would be or how we will be seeing the world in 2025 where we are seeing enough amount of disruptions so what i see is like you know that's my point of view i mean you know it is just uh, like you know uh, based on the past experience what we see is like you know there are tremendous forces uh, like you know which are creating a disruption in our industries like so today when we are passing out of symbiosis institute you will obviously have those questions in the mind you have tremendous amount of energy to do something which can be a very differentiative in nature innovative in nature so like you know what are the three basic fundamental pillars with with this kind of zeal and energy that you are carrying in the market and you are entering into the market right so what we have seen like you know from from ibm perspective or from accenture perspective or from a tcs or like you know whatever industries that i have cut across in last 22 years is there are like you know three different forces or three unique forces which are playing a role over here we the consumers or as i can say we ourselves as an individual are the center of reshaping the world right you know we have started adopting ubers we have started adopting ola we have started adopting swiggy and zomato right so everywhere like you know we are becoming center to the location so i'll say location is heart of everything and that's where like you know if you see we as a consumer are the first pillars of this particular disruption secondly like you know this disruption cannot sustain till the time we have a proven business model so there is entire shift of mindset right if you see our parents like you know or rather i i'll talk about my parents and then and, and obviously the my my children like you know the entire adoption of the technology which is seen uh, like you know and, and like you know some of you who have their elderly parents have started doing whatsapp video calling right you know they will agree that our parents have started adopting to the digital shift so that's a shift that has been modeled by the businesses right and where we have started seeing elderly parents started using facebook started using instagram right so that's a complete shift and that shift has hap happened just because of the policies of the data and trust me the the disruptive policy change that has happened in liberalizing the indian indian mapping policy is going to reshape our careers like anything and which is going to bring our gis as a center of the entire technology now we are not talking about a technology which is just limited to ai which is not limited to blockchain which is not limited to erp which is not limited to just iot gis is becoming a part and parcel or geo intelligence is becoming a part and parcel of each and every decision that business models are going to take in the new strategy game a slight uh, like you know diverging on to the numbers specifically if you see on 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 uh, the right bottom corner in last 10 years there has been almost like 140 startups and this is something like you know a kind of a survey which has come up while back in by morgan stanley that 
Google Map have influenced almost one billion users, like you know, in 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 last ten years, and it has contributed to almost like four point eight billion dollars of annual revenue. This is just a kind of a high level analysis that geospatial industry is talking about. So we are actually sitting on a mine, right? You know, it's just going to open up. So I'm not hyping it again i am saying it it's basically a tremendous amount of potential which is going to come and to do that like you know the three pillars or the three disruptors which we talk about we as a consumers are creating that innovations or we are we are forcing the business to get into innovations to you leverage the technology and create a kind of you know a, a, a change or a shift in the entire mindset and the adoption of the people this brings me to uh, like you know this particular policy i thought let me just touch upon and spend two minutes on like you know some statistics currently the mapping like you know which and which dr tp singh also uh, like you know touched upon that we are uh, we are just hardly few percentages uh, of the entire potential of the industry which is going to open up we are almost in terms of the size and this article i mean there are some sna snapshots that you are seeing on the right hand side i have taken it from economic times uh, i think a couple of weeks back in economic times i was just reading an article which was an analysis of the new mapping policy which government of india has unearthed and this goes uh, like you know as a part and parcel of the growth that india as a country is talking about so let me talk about like you know a, a era a one year before before pandemic right before pandemic before february 2020 or before march 2020 people or the world were seeing india as more of a back office like you no know, india from a technology perspective we used to have our talents doing kind of you know invoice processing doing uh, like you know payments for the banks working as a call center in the back end right you know taking out the queries so india was seen by the entire rest of the world as a back office like, you know, that we can do a kind of, you know, some kind of a finance work, some kind of a, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, call taking jobs. But the entire pandemic has changed the entire mindset that India can also become a manufacturing hub. Like, you know, people, investors or the, uh, the large industries have started shifting their base from an Asia pack to India. With that fact in the mind, Technology is something is like you know is inevitable. The take the growth of technology is going to be inevitable, and and if you see, I mean, there are some figures that I have thrown over here. It's like you know, by twenty twenty five, we are seeing this entire technology industry is going to grow up to almost three hundred and fifty billion. And I'm I'm just being pessimistic over here. If you see the last growth of the jobs that has been added purely from an IT industry perspective is like. We have added almost like around four, more than two and a half to four lakhs of people onto the additional four million workforces. This is purely, purely on the IT industry perspective. Now, with the potential of or the impact of the map policy, if you see the current map policy, which is confined to us, we call it, used to call it as a GIS industry, but it's no more a GIS industry. It's going to become a kind of applied industry in each and every industry verticals which we talk about we talk about smart cities we talk about real estate we talk about e-commerce we talk about mining we talk about telecom every industry is going to have a data we talk about service industry for example today if you see like you know if you want to order food for your friend from zomato right you can or sitting over here you can order food in bangalore Sitting over here, you can order a book uh, or like you know, book a cab for your parents, like you know, sitting somewhere remotely in the country, right? It's just why it's happening. It's just because of the liberalization of the data and the kind of potential that that industries have started looking at. We at IBM, like you know, I have seen our industry peers, like in Microsoft, in Google, and then and Rakesh is there, my friend from Amazon. They have started realizing the fact that GIS is the center of every decision the agility that we're trying to bring it into the market like today amazon is able to like you know suggest through a deep learning and a machine learning that okay i'll be able to ship this particular wristwatch to you in two working days right it's happening just because of the data which is in the back end so you are like you know you would have seen in in your courses of informatics and like you know geoinformatics courses all the applications of gis but what i'm trusting about is the kind of career prospect that is going to open up uh, is a part of this particular entire revolution that we are sitting and you are entering into the market at the right time. Let me 
tell you guys, I mean, you know, you are entering into a time where there is an immense amount of requirement of the skill sets. People are hiring left, right and center. Like, you know, and I just wanted to share with Dr. T.P. Singh that last year, IBM, uh, uh, IBM, I mean, just internal numbers, IBM had some 4,200 talent in entire 2020. We are sitting in March or rather, I can say first week of March. So far, we have already rolled out an offer for almost like 3,900 people. So what we have done last year in one year, we have done it in two months. So you can just see the kind of shift or the demand which is opening up. And it's not just about uh, IT industry. It's not just about uh, cutting edge technology of IoT, automation, RPA, blockchain. It's all about data, like, you know, the geo-intelligence that we are talking about. And that brings me to the behavior, you know, as we are talking about. And and you guys, I mean, you guys are passing out. I mean, when I'm talking about you guys, you, you as the students, geo-intelligence and the applied of the of applications of the data is something which is going to be a center. And we are our own career makers. And I don't, like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really proud in saying this particular statement that we are, our, we are making our, shaping our own careers through the adoption of digital technologies some of the facts and figures that i have told that we as a millennials right or rather you guys as a millennials are the upcoming generations who are going to dictate the behavior of the industries right you know? and that's the reason i mean and why I'm, I'm i'm just elaborating more and more on this because 80 percent of our millennials have have moved the behavior of the entire industries and you know and i'm sorry for this so uh, coming back to again like you know everywhere the geo geographical data are going to drive the strategies just sharing an experience like you know H&M for example right or uh, I'm, I'm just give, giving a live example when H&M was planning to enter in India four years back they did a, a kind of you know cultural survey that how the geographical behavior or within India is going to be like you know in terms of adoption of the products which they are going to launch in the market like similarly like you know china japan they are they are actually changing the way at which the entire experience so i'm here i've given experience about a shopping experience because this is a, these are some of the data that uh, or some uh, some a couple of charts that i have taken from my recent interaction with one of the major shopping giant uh, uh, based out of asia pack and they plan to grow their outlets um, uh, in india so here also they have started talking about that how can i get the geographical behavior the analysis of the behavior of the consumers in that particular territory so if you see the buying behavior of the people in pune itself right will vary the people like you know in the central part of pune will have a different buying behavior compared to eastern part of pune or a western part of pune so when we when we bring in that intelligence layer and that's where we like you know uh, bring in that intelligence of geographical power so that's that's how I mean it's, it's a very schooling thoughts or basic thoughts, but I'm cognizant of the time as well. So moving forward, and feel free to like you know interrupt me or like you know ask for any questions uh, over here. So before I move and like you know take a glimpse of the future, uh, like you know that how GIS is going to look like, or how the industry is going or enterprise is going to look like in 2025, I would just like to take a pause and like you know would request all of you to just have a look at these four building blocks of our future right we are going to talk about personalization right so before i move, start moving forward and talk about some of the numbers uh, but, uh, i'm happy to take any questions in between uh, so dr das i mean uh, uh, are there any questions on the chat which uh, i can address no sir participants you can post your questions in the chat box yep or maybe you can like you know, unmute yourself if if uh, the policy allows and uh, you can ask questions we'll be very happy to make it more interactive if any participants wants to directly interact with dr rupees so he can just uh, give message in the chat box yep okay so uh, benefit of time i'll just move on um, so Basically, how the GIS or the geospatial industry or the geo-intelligence uh, industry is going to look like, like, you know, two or three years down the lines, everything is going to be AI enabled, right? When we're talking about a, a small glimpse, like, you know, a, a RPA, everybody, 
or every one of us in, in some point of time in last one year would have interacted with a bot, right? Uh, like, you know, you place an order on a Swiggy or a Zomato and you would make it corrected, right? So you would have interacted with a bot. So people are going to talk about how the data, like, you know, you are bringing it is going to help make a differentiation and create a personalized experience for our consumers. Like, you know, so here we are not classifying ourselves as a manufacturing industry or an automobile industry or a retail industry or uh, like, you know, services industry. Here we are talking about a personalization. Everybody today is talking about personalization. You, you, you go for a new car, the, the, like, you know, the Mercedes and the BMWs and the, like you know, any car manufacturer, they'll be talking about the personalized experience. How personalized experience happens is about the behavior that we bring in onto the table. Right? The behavior technology enabled behavior that we as as a as, as a millennials have brought into the industry. Second is obviously uh, GI is going to become a platform in itself. Right. You know, GIS is not no more going to be just a tool or just a software. It's going to be a platform in itself where we are going to take care of the, the strategic decisions that will be taken using the data that we are going to bring it uh, to the consumers. The third is like, you know, agility, like, you know, the intelligent automation and the data engineers are going to play a very, very important role in the entire agile development process. So when we are talking about like, you know, digital workers, for example, right? Today we are seeing, you know, we have, we, you, once you pass out and you start working on to the manufacturing plants or you, you move towards a supermarket, you will basically see a digital worker who will be like, you know, helping you out in taking your day-to-day -day decisions. A simple example, like, you know, we have just implemented a small case study in lifestyle. Like, you know, when you enter into a lifestyle, like, you know, a lifestyle store, there are various barcodes there at various counters and various brands. Like, you know, they are typically a multi-brand stores. You scan one of the barcodes through your smartphone. Through that particular barcode, it will, like, you know, based on your past data, the past brands that you have taken, it will start generating real-time promotions, the trade promotions that, okay, you buy a, a trouser, you get a 20% off on the second piece. Or you buy a, like, you know, a, a new fillet uh, shirt, you get 10% uh, off on, on, on the blazer. So a similar product range. So that's the kind of, you know, personalization in the digital workforce that's going to be ruling the market. And it's all dependent, again, on the intelligence and the geographical intelligence because every store or every retail outlet or every manufacturing plant or every product, right, will have its own set of personalized requirements. So that's a potential, guys, I mean, you are talking about in terms of the career prospects. Okay. Uh, I'll just touch upon uh, just last two minutes of like, I'll just touch upon a small use case that we have just uh, tried to uh, like, you know, portray for one of our client. Like, you know, uh, this is basically going to be a real time story when you enter into a uh, like, you know, supermarket, like uh, it's, it's all in live in, in like, you know, some of the geographies in Dubai and Singapore and it's going to be in India as well. When you start entering the, the Star Bazaars and the Tesco or uh, Nature's Basket, that you enter or a particular, like, you know, a supermarket, you go to a shelf where there are, like, you know, there are multiple sensors. It can be a camera-based sensors. And these are all applications or use cases of GI that's live and in, 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 in it, it not just a concept. It's basically live available in the industries so you go to a particular shelf you pick up a product right there are rfid tags attached to that the moment you pick up the product the the, the sensor senses that okay this product has been picked up on a real-time basis the gateway which is running on into the supermarket will define like you know a real-time basis pay that you have picked up let's say for example you have picked up a five kg of a washing powder based on the five kg of washing powder based on your past behavior like you know you register through an app when you enter into a store. You you connect to a particular supermarket platform. It will give you a real time option that okay you have you have already picked up an item worth five hundred rupees. I am giving you fifty rupees or hundred rupees of additional vouchers which you can collect it from your favorite XYZ brand. So that's the integration uh, which we are talking about. And everything here we are talking about it's all geographic, right? A client entering into a supermarket, it's a geographical instance. Picking up from a particular shelf, it's a geographical instance. 
integrating and generating a real time offer based on the geographical behavior it's again a geo intelligence so everything we are talking about it's it's all geographic behavior that like you no know, we, uh, we are touching in our day to day lives right so happy to take the questions and that's what i wanted to like you know touch upon that the entire world is going to be become a uniform uniform experience and we are going to move from a physical touch points to a digital touch points so that's a random shift that we are going to experience in coming 5 years right so and and you guys are going to drive that particular transformation for us right so it's, we are talking about smart homes we are talking about like you know a uh, uh, self service kiosk at the airports we are talking about uh, virtual reality and augmented realities right in a, in a in a like you know furniture shop so everything is going to be become a digital touch points and you are going to experience with the digital workers and going to happen only through a geographic demographic interventions right so so that's that's where i am like you know uh, my coordinates are right below on the left left corner so i mean you know please feel free to reach out to me for any kind of a kind of you know support guidance or interactions required will be very happy to uh, like you know connect with you and uh, with the cognizant of time like you know i hope uh, i am able to bring in some kind of a like you know excitement into the uh, students who are actually entering and we are welcoming those students in the industry uh, there are three questions uh, sure. the first question is from uh, mr murali yep uh, he has mentioned it's a interesting presentation his question is should geo intelligence be integrated in a to z of human activities through connected mobility yes it it's in as as you have seen in my last use case that you have seen that you are entering into a supermarket and every shelf in the supermarket right right from the end point to enter into a supermarket there are like you know interventions from a geographic aspect right so a to z of human activities there are like you know integrated today when you are like you know it's it's not a new concept right that you are living from an office and you are controlling your car through an app right you want your car like you know the ac of the car to be switched on so car knows that where you are parked and in the app you know that where your car is parked right so a to z day to day lives I mean, let me tell you it's it's all we are geographically integrated i hope i can answer your question we have second question from mr prakash how the knowledge gap of geospatial student in it sector relate to coding and product development is handled so very good question i mean i really like uh, this particular question so honestly if you talk about 10 years before there was a gap i'll say like you know there was a technology gap between what we are passing it out and what we are coming up now right now if you talk about the the technological requirement like we are talking about requirement of java we are talking about requirement of python we are talk, we are like you know talking about the front end developments on on aws on azure on google cloud on ibm cloud so everything is like you know gradually converging into a one single technological stack so if you see the digital world it's shrinking like you know that like you know there is nothing called a proprietary nowadays uh, in 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 today's it industry so it professional is no different from a gis professional gis professional is like you know the core for a it professional developing a app for a zomatos or swiggies of the world you are pumping the data you are exposing an apis right for the blockchain blockchain expert or a blockchain developer right who is working for a hardcore it application so the 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 boundaries have gone like you know we are talking about a borderless world now in terms of the technological aspect we have another question from mr jamir mm -hmm. are human behavior on a public place example crime behavior based on the recent browse data mm, i could not decipher this question no other uh let me are also having a human behavior on a public place personal behavior based on recent browse data i am i am not able to get the question uh, appropriately if you can help me uh, jamir to understand jamir can you please uh, so i think uh, uh, jamir uh, 
uh, you have a rupee uh, uh, rupees panjani email id so you yes. can elaborate this question and send to him so that he might be uh, uh, get, um, give you that the proper information about this uh, what you require sure and my mobile number and uh, uh, email id's are there is uh, yeah. uh, dr ringe said and i'm I'll, i'm sorry it's an error in my email id it's in.ibm.com it's a typo error my my apologies yeah i'll just uh, <laughs> like you know correct my apologies here i don't know i'll just correct it right away yep any further questions feedback i hope you liked the session i mean this was my last chart so like you know participants can post their questions on the chat box or if they want to speak to dr rupesh panjani he can uh, post the message on the chat box yep perfect so if no questions maybe i mean uh, i would like to uh, thank you all for hearing me out and really thanks rakesh and dr singh dr das for like you know giving me this particular opportunity to interact with such a nice uh, bright futures that is coming and we are welcoming you to all with a, from an industry perspective i feel a bit old now you know because now i feel that like you know new generation is coming and like you know i mean on on a lighter note tipi singh sir i mean we still remember like you know in early 2000 in our dehradun like you know we used to say that how the world is going to look like with such a massive data coming in right so Correct. here we are right <laughs> so, so thank you thank you uh, rupesh and thank you rakesh for uh, your nice session in fact and very interactive and you have given that you no know, uh, the whole uh, picture of uh, industry picture where that industry is moving actually what industry requirement is there and what are the geo spatial prospect i am saying a geo spatial but now it has come up in the geo intelligence where that no ai ml or uh, dl is coming in 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 this uh, um, in in the coupling with that uh, geo spatial technology so uh, thank you uh, both of you and in a very short time in fact that uh, you have given us a uh, um uh, means your approval to come for this session and yeah. uh, uh, we have informed you even that the seven days before and i am very thank to both of you thank you and uh, uh, have a good day ahead yeah thank you so thank much you sir so i mean it was an honor to speak uh, in this forum and to share uh, the stage with you and rupesh sir i mean uh, i i couldn't have asked for more thank you so much for thank such you. an thank insightful session thank you to all my participants also those who have those who are present here and they also came in a very short notice around that 170 175 or 180 participant within that the very and the maximum are out of symbiosis actually so they are not from the symbiosis uh, yeah, okay. student nice. maximum are from a different uh, places so uh, that that was that idea that to sens sensitize them that uh, how the geospatial technology is working uh, what what is the future of a geospatial technology and no one better than the both of you actually to tell them about uh, where the geospatial technology uh, one is working in the ibm and another is that uh, technology giant of uh, amazon uh, so uh, yes uh, we got that uh, some information from the two experts and i hope that each and every cloud has now clear about that uh, the future of uh, pro future prospects of uh, geospatial technology thank you thank you and uh, have a great day ahead thank you sure everyone same, sir thank you yeah thank you everyone and wish you a bright future ahead thank you sir yeah all participants are requested to fill up the feedback form to get the certificate the feedback form is kept in the chat box the certificate will be issued in the next 15 days so we conclude the session here thank you everyone